So now, having finished our time looking at external financial reporting, we are now going to look inward to management accounting, which is the internal data that managers use to run their business. As we will see over the next several chapters, the area of management accounting is extraordinarily broad. As I said back at the beginning of the course, virtually every decision you make in business will be based on information that comes out of an accounting system. So this is covering quite a bit of ground. One of the big things that we're going to do differently is that we're going to shift from the concept of expense, which is a cost you match with revenues, and look at costs themselves, which are a little more basic in nature. If you recall our discussion on matching, we would incur a cost and then decide whether or not we should match it with revenues for the sake of external reporting. Since we're now talking about real-time management decisions, we'll actually look at those costs as they happen before the sales, since many of our decisions need to be made before the product actually goes to market. So what sorts of uses do we have for this internally generated data? First and foremost, we can look at pricing and production decisions. And when I say production, I don't mean this solely as a manufacturing firm issue. This relates to resellers of other people's goods, and even service firms, whose product is that service they provide the client. We need to understand the true cost underlying a product or service if we're going to have a successful business. This means getting a grip on every single little place we're spending money within the business to support our work for the customer. We're using resources in all sorts of places, not just in the acquisition of the product from our supplier or the wages we pay our service providers. From warehousing to transfer costs to overhead to support services, we're spending money in all sorts of places. And if we don't really know what those costs are, we aren't going to be able to establish prices that will yield the return we're looking for. Before we even get to the point where we're buying inventory from our supplier or hiring our service providers, we need to know this stuff. Perhaps we'll find out that we don't belong in the market at all. Of course, we've got budgeting decisions. Chapter 13 is all about budgeting, and we'll come back to this then. But of course, we should have a budget that lays out our operations for the upcoming months. Purchasing, production, hiring, all sorts of processes need to be set in motion to arrive at the desired output. What we sell in December during the Christmas season is made in September, and the orders for the raw materials are placed in July. The audits and tax returns we do during busy season in February are done by staff we hire and train the prior fall. And budgets serve not just a forward-looking role. Of course, after the fact, it's good to go back and compare what happened to what we expected to happen, and make sure that we understand the differences that occurred. That way, going forward, we will be better prepared for future periods. Resource Acquisition and Cash Sufficiency As we're budgeting out our production for future periods, we may find that we need to expand capacity to meet needs. And depending on our operating cycle and how quickly we can turn inventory, do we believe we'll have sufficient cash at each step along the process? Or are we going to need to secure short-term borrowings to make payroll and pay bills? If that's the case, the sooner we are aware of it, the easier our negotiations with the bank will be. We can use our internal data to identify growth opportunities. Which specific product lines generate the greatest profit for what we put into it? Where should we concentrate our marketing strategies to maximize value? And does it make sense for us to invest further resources into equipment or personnel, given what we know about the product environment? Lastly, on the other side of operations, we have performance measurement. The accountants kind of grabbed this as their own, though the lines are somewhat blurred between accounting and management with this. Certainly, we can evaluate units based on how their performance compared to budgets, but there's more to it than that. How did we do for on-time arrivals? What was our customer satisfaction rating? Did our employees take full advantage of educational opportunities accorded to them? Those sorts of things get reported through what is essentially an accounting system as well. So those are the things we'll be looking at over the next several chapters. If these sorts of topics interest you, I would encourage you to take a standalone course in managerial accounting. We will be only scratching the surface of what really is a broad topic, and there is much you could learn in a full semester. Before we get to any of that, we're going to need to establish some definitions that will make it easier for us to think about all the different things that we can do. The first set of terms relate to different ways we can classify the costs our business faces. We start with product cost versus period cost. And this is actually a distinction that we've already seen in this class in a different context. If you recall, back in the inventory chapter, we took any cost required to get inventory ready for sale and capitalized it as part of inventory cost. We're going to be doing the same thing here. Not for the sake of matching revenues and expenses, but for the sake of understanding what it truly costs to produce a good or service. Any cost that can be traced directly or indirectly is a product cost, 
Everything else is a period cost. The second set of categories is direct versus indirect costs. And this distinction expands well beyond the product production level. Any cost object within the firm can have direct and indirect costs associated with it. The direct cost is one that is, well, directly traceable to that cost object, whereas the indirect cost is one that applies to multiple cost objects, so is going to need to be allocated in some manner. Now, what is a cost object? Anything within the firm that requires costs. It could be a piece of inventory. In that case, the direct cost is the raw materials we purchase to manufacture the inventory, and an indirect cost is the depreciation on the machinery on which the inventory was produced. It could be a manufacturing plant, in which case that depreciation is now considered a direct cost, and the indirect cost would be the salary of the executive VP that oversees production at several factories. The last set is fixed versus variable. Fixed costs do not scale with production, within reason. If we're renting a warehouse where we produce our product, the rent is the same if we produce zero, a thousand, or two thousand units. That cost is fixed. Variable costs scale with production. If we want to make more tables, we're going to need more wood, more metal, and more labor. This distinction is only valid within what we call a relevant range. And the relevant range is our current productive capacity without adding any new capacity. And this should make sense because, yeah, our costs are fixed if we want to make a thousand units or two thousand units, but what if we want to make twenty thousand, or a hundred thousand, or a million? Chances are that little warehouse we're renting isn't going to be big enough for us to expand capacity by a hundredfold or more. So the fixed cost is fixed within reason. If we scale our production up sufficiently, that fixed cost will need to be adjusted. So let's look at how we accumulate product costs for a manufacturing firm. We can do the same thing for a service firm, but labor will be a much bigger component and raw materials will be much smaller. What goes into the production of a product? There are three components of product cost. The first couple are obvious. Direct materials, the wood for the tables, the sheet metal for the automobiles, the Salisbury steaks for the hungry man dinners. And, of course, direct labor, what we pay the people on the production line to assemble the cars and cook the foods. And then we have overhead. So here we have those indirect product costs. These are the costs that we are incurring that don't map one-to-one -one with specific products, but we know we need to incur for the production process to happen. And what sorts of things are there? Our indirect labor, the supervisor and janitorial salaries. If we don't have a project foreman, the work doesn't get done. If we don't have someone sweeping up the metal filings at the end of every day, soon we'll be up to our necks in metal filings and no work can get done. These jobs are critical to production, but aren't directly related to specific products. Our utilities and facilities costs. If we don't pay the light bill, the machines won't have electricity to run. If we don't pay the rent, we get evicted and can't produce anything. Again, here are costs that we absolutely must incur, but are not directly traceable to a particular product. So, we allocate that cost among everything we produce that is made in the warehouse, or that uses electricity. What about depreciation? We spend $10,000 to buy that donut hole machine, and that cost needs to get into inventory. So, we'll apply it to all the stuff that gets made on that machine. We have trivially priced raw materials and maintenance materials. So let's say we make something that needs a few ball bearings in each unit, and we buy our ball bearings in cases of 20000 We are going to try to identify the cost of specific ball bearings, and then multiply that cost by three, and then apply that to each specific product. That's just more effort than it's worth. Instead, we simply look to see how many ball bearings we used in a period, and apply that aggregate cost across all the products made in the same period. The cost is getting there, but in an indirect manner. Similarly, let's say our equipment needs to be lubricated twice a day. All those cans of WD-40, if the amount is material, should be applied to inventory, since that is a cost of keeping the machines up and running and producing product. Lastly, overtime pay and shift differential pay should be allocated in the same manner. Why? Because say I make golf balls in my plant 24 hours a day, 7 days a week, and I pay the overnight shift a dollar per hour differential. Do we really want to say that those golf balls I made overnight really cost more than the ones I make during the day? Not really, because when I set my prices based on what it costs me to make the product, I can't charge the customer extra for the overnight balls. I only have a single price, so I treat that shift differential as a cost of achieving an overall level of production, and will apply that extra cost to all the golf balls I make. Same thing with overtime. 
So when we're thinking about the cost of producing inventory, it's not just the obvious, but it's all the little things too. Now, to add to the confusion, we can accumulate costs within our accounting system one of two ways. We can use job order costing, or we can use process costing. Job order costing is exactly what it sounds like. We're going to treat each job as a discrete cost activity, and we'll keep track of each cost as it enters the process. We may have multiple jobs going at once, but each one will be treated as a separate item. Manufacturing firms will typically have a job ticket or job costing sheet that will indicate the job number on the top, what it's for, and then the resources as they are applied will get entered into this sheet. So we'll have a sheet that looks like this. We'll have job number one, and we'll have our materials over here. We'll have our labor over here. Service firms will have employees allocate their billable time to specific jobs as well. So in real time, we can look at a particular job and see what resources we've committed to it. And at the end of the job, we'll have a full accounting of all the direct costs incurred to complete it. Now, who uses this sort of system? Say we manufacture spec-built machinery for specific clients. Each piece of machinery may be a little bit different, so it makes sense to track all those costs individually. Say we're an accounting firm performing financial statement audits for our clients. The size and complexity of the client will dictate how many hours of labor of different levels of staff will be needed, and they will clock their time individually. Say we're an ambulance company, and we dispatch the ambulance. The costs will be different depending on whether it's a simple transport job, or if the EMTs need to deploy special equipment or medications. So we're talking about small volume, large value items, generally speaking. The other option is process costing, which looks at the production process as a constant flow of multiple batches of some relatively homogeneous product. Say we're producing golf balls. One batch of balls should cost virtually the same as the next, as the next, as the next. So tracking individual costs at each step along the way isn't really value added for us. What we care about is that when we've got a batch of balls out of the production process, we know how much cost we incurred. We know how many balls came out, and we know on average how much each of those balls costs us. Who uses this? Low-cost, high-volume production manufacturers. Like, well, golf ball companies. The last choice for us to make has to do with how we actually get those costs in the accounting system. And our choices are actual costing, standard costing, or normal costing. With the actual costing system, we're putting in costs in real time as that information becomes available to us. So every time we pull some raw materials out of the warehouse, those get entered. Every time someone does some work, that gets entered. And this would be a lovely system if it weren't for the fact that some of the information isn't available in real time, but actually lags production. Our electricity bill comes to us after we've used the electricity. Our tax assessments may vary from year to year. So our actual costing system is a tricky thing to implement in most cases. Instead, we can use what's called a normal costing system, which alleviates that lack of information problem. While we will continue to track labor and raw materials in real time using actual data, we will use an estimate for our overhead costs based on our best guess. We know roughly what the electricity should be, given how many hours we ran the machinery. We know roughly what our taxes will be, though perhaps they may be a little bit different this year than last. We will ultimately true up the costs of the accounting system as the actual bills come in, but in the meanwhile, we will do the best we can with the estimates we've got. One last option we can use is the standard costing system, which actually does all costing based on standard rates. That is, they know how much it should cost to produce a particular product, based on engineer estimates or just past experience, and that's what they use to cost a particular product or product run. Of course, we are spending money in real time, and those amounts may not be exactly what we expect them to be, so at the end of the period, we'll again do a true up between what we think we should have spent and what we actually spent, and then we'll try to explain those variances. We'll talk more about variances in the next class. So those are the choices we have to make regarding how we're going to track those costs flowing through our system so that we can get the most accurate picture of what it truly costs us to produce our product. Again, this is of paramount importance to us, because without knowing our true costs, we are likely going to overprice our products, costing us customers, or underprice our products, resulting in lost profits and perhaps even business failure. So let's look at this standard overhead rate thing a bit in greater detail, since virtually everyone will be using at least a normal system. 
How do we get that standard rate we apply to our product cost? Well, we come back to that fixed versus variable thing that we were just talking about. All overhead costs are either one or the other. So here I have some basic costs broken down to that dichotomy, and we'll start with the variable costs. We know that for every hour of machine time, we're going to spend a buck twenty on indirect labor costs. That would be janitorial time, perhaps, or supervisor time, that sort of thing. And we know that we have to keep the machines lubricated, and that uses indirect materials. And of course, we pay for electricity based on how much we use. These are all costs associated with production, but are not directly attributable to any specific item. So we pool them as overhead. Our next step is to determine how much we expect to be incurring these costs. That is, how much machine time will we be using? Because the more machine time we use, the more we're spending on each of these items. I've listed out two possible production amounts, which we can say is running one shift versus two shifts a day. If we run the machines 20,000 hours a month, we're going to incur $24,000 of cost. If we run that second shift and do 40,000 hours, we're looking at $48,000 in costs. The same holds true for indirect materials and electricity costs. And we end up with a total variable cost per machine hour of $1.82. Regardless of the amount that we run our machines, that's going to be the same, since these variable costs increase linearly with production. We do the same thing with our fixed costs. We rent our facilities, and that's fixed. If we run one shift or two shifts, the rent to the landlord is the same. If we depreciate our equipment on a straight line basis over X years, that will also be the same. Of course, we could have variable depreciation, but let's not worry about that right now. We have manager salaries and insurance costs, and the electric company charges us a base rate that we incur whether or not we're running the machines, so that's fixed. All of these costs will be the same regardless of whether we do 20,000 or 40,000 hours a month. What does change is our fixed cost per machine hour, though. Our total fixed costs are $62,600, and if we allocate them over 20,000 hours, we get $3.13 per hour. But if we allocate them over 40,000 hours, the rate drops to $1.57. And now we can come up with a total overhead rate, depending on how much production we plan on doing. If we have 20,000 hours of production, we'll add the dollar of 82 a variable cost with the $3.13 of fixed costs and a total overhead rate of $4.95 per hour. And that's what we'll put into our inventory cost. If we have 40,000 hours of production, however, we'll add that same $1.82 of variable cost to our now lower $1.57 of fixed costs and we'll get $3.39 per machine hour. This will ultimately get expensed as costs of goods sold when we sell those products. So let's do an example. Here are some opening balances for our inventory accounts at the beginning of the month. You'll note that we have three different types of inventory accounts. Our raw materials are the things we've bought from our suppliers. Our work in process is inventory that's had some value added to the manufacturing process. And we've got finished goods inventory which is the stuff that's completely done and ready to go out the door to customers. So there are our opening balances, and then we did a bunch of stuff. And what we need to do is get all this stuff into our accounting system. Now, we're no longer talking about financial reporting, but we're going to continue to use the same debit and credit system we've been using since Chapter 3, since it remains an efficient way of accumulating data. If you'll remember back in Chapter 5, we had purchases and costs of goods sold and all that good stuff. All we're going to do now is expand a bit upon that framework. We'll go ahead and use a perpetual inventory system for now. So item one, we purchased some raw materials. Just like in chapter five, when we bought inventory, we debit inventory and we credit accounts payable. We're a manufacturing firm, however, so when we purchase inventory, it's raw material inventory, and that's what we'll debit. And now that we've bought some raw materials, we'll start to use it in production. We'll take that stuff out of our raw material closet, reducing the account with a credit, and we'll transfer it into our work in process inventory by debiting it. All we've done here is shift numbers from one account to another. Here's inventory going down, here's inventory going up. But it's important so that we have an accurate picture of how much stuff we've got in raw materials and how much stuff is out on the production floor. And then we pay our employees some wages. 
damn labor laws. We haven't paid them yet, though. They've only been accrued. So we credit that liability wages payable. Now, in the past, when we owed our employees wages, we debited wage expense. However, why do we owe our employees money? We owe them those wages because they came to do work, to generate revenues. And when are the revenues associated with this work earned? Not until the inventory is sold, right? So this is a cost of getting that inventory ready for sale, and matching tells us to capitalize that as an asset. So the debit will go to work in process inventory, not expense. This represents the value added to our inventory through labor. And then, of course, we credit wages payable. Depreciation time. 1900 bucks of depreciation. And we know that the credit here is going to go to accumulated depreciation. Now, once again, we're not going to debit the expense for the exact same reason we didn't debit the expense up with our wages payable. However, we're not going to debit work in process inventory. And here's where things get a wee bit funky. We're using a normal costing system, which means that while we're going to keep track of our actuals for our direct materials and our direct labor up here, for all of our overhead costs, we're going to put them in a temporary account called overhead control. This will eventually get into inventory and then cost a goods sold, but for the meanwhile, we'll hold it here. We could have put this directly into work in process, but using this control account provides an important benefit to our costing system, specifically standardization. Let's say that we're running our production in batches, and one day some numbskull knocks over a drum of oil with a forklift, and all the oil spills on the floor and down the drain. Oops. Now, that oil is an indirect material, and rightfully belongs in overhead. The janitorial costs associated with the cleanup is indirect labor, and rightfully belongs in overhead. However, do we really want the cost of that job that's been running at that particular time to absorb the cost of that random mistake? The product produced on July 15th is more costly than the product produced on July 16th because of a fluke? How does that help us make pricing and production decisions? It doesn't. That lost material will need to get into inventory and cost the goods sold eventually, but we'll worry about that at the end of the period as an adjustment. This is exactly what we'll do if we run those multiple shifts and pay that wage differential for the overnight shift. We're making those golf balls again. Are the golf balls we make overnight really more expensive than the golf balls we make during the day? No, that's silly. If our production quotas mean that we have to run double shifts or pay overtime, that incremental amount should be applied to all of the golf balls produced at the period. The wages we pay those overnight folks will go mostly to work in process, with the differential getting debited to overhead control. And that, of course, leads us to our next item the indirect labor we pay. We're going to credit cash with the debit going where? To overhead control. Our insurance expires. Credit the prepaid, but no debit to insurance expense. Why? Because it's product cost. Debit overhead control. We receive, but don't pay the utility bill. Debit overhead control and credit utilities payable. We pay for maintenance on the factory. Same thing. Debit overhead control and credit cash. So now we've accumulated all those overhead costs, and now it's time for us to do our application. We would have done that analysis we did a couple of slides ago to come up with an overhead rate per labor hour. And let's say that that yielded a rate of $3.50 per direct labor hour. In fact, that was given to us in the problem. How many direct labor hours did we have? 2,200. So that's going to give us overhead costs of $7,700. That goes into work in process and comes out of overhead control. There's that temporary account being reduced. To the extent that our $3.50 rate was too high or too low, we'd close that variance into cost of goods sold at the end of the period. We transferred some product from work in process to finished goods. How do we know? Because we've got those job tickets, remember? We know what costs we incurred producing all that stuff. So when we transfer it off the production floor into our finished goods warehouse, we know exactly how much that product cost us, including applied overhead. We have less work in process, so credit that, and more finished goods, so debit that. Lastly, we sell some product. And we remember how to do that from Chapter 5. Debit accounts receivable and credit sales. Debit costs of goods sold and credit our finished goods inventory. And we're done. Whew. So now that was assuming they used the perpetual method, keeping track of everything in all the inventory accounts in real time. But what if they used the periodic method?
In that case, we're going to have to back into our ending amounts and our cost of goods sold, essentially using the same equation, beginning inventory plus purchases minus cost of goods sold equals ending inventory that we've been using all along. And that's what we see here on the schedule of cost of goods manufactured. Here we'll calculate the cost of the stuff that we made, and then we'll be able to calculate cost of goods sold. So how much stuff did we manufacture? Well, if we start with our beginning work in process, account for what we added to work in process, look at what we have left at the end of the period, what we completed and transferred out into finished goods will be what pops right out of the equation, just like we did in Chapter 5 with the periodic method to cost of goods sold journal entry. So we began the year with $16,000 in work in process, and we need to know what we added. Well, how do we know what we added since we weren't keeping track of that stuff in real time? Well, let's back up a bit and let's do the same thing with our raw materials. And that'll tell us how much got transferred down to the production floor. Raw materials began at $10,000. And we know we bought some because we've got an account called purchases that was tracking it. How much did we buy? we bought $31,000. This means that over the course of this period, we had a total of $41,000 of raw material available. But we ended with only $3,000. How do we know? We went out and counted, right? We always count. Now, what does this mean? We must have used $38,000 in production. Did we really use $38,000? Maybe, maybe not. Maybe some was broken, spoiled, stolen. We don't know, and that's one of the problems with the periodic method. But that's what we're going to use for our raw material transfers. So we used $38,000 of raw materials in production. We had some labor costs, and we know what those are because our HR folks handle payroll, and they told us what that number was, $19,000. And we know what our overhead was because we're still keeping track of machine hours out on those job tickets. That's still 7700 so, we know how much total cost went into production between these three items, totaling $64,700. What does that mean? Between what we started with and what we added to work in process, we have a total of $80,700 of work in process inventory flowing through the production system during the month. We go out at, and at the end of the month and we do a count and we see what? That we've got $27,100 of inventory on hand. What must have happened? We completed inventory costing $53,600 and that's the cost of goods that we manufactured. Now what does that number do for us? It's now the number that would be used as purchases in our periodic accounting system journal entry. Let's look at one more schedule, which is yet another iteration of beginning inventory plus purchases minus cost of goods sold equals ending inventory. We've got our beginning inventory of $2,500. And what did we add to that beginning inventory? The 53600 that was transferred out of work in process into finished goods. So, we had a total of $56,100 of finished goods inventory available to sell. We go out and count what we've got in our finished goods warehouse, and we discover that we've got $6,100 on hand. Which means that here's our unknown. We must have sold $50,000 of inventory. So, we can do this either way perpetual or periodic. And of course, we have to use our LIFO or FIFO or average cost, but we really don't need to get into that level of complexity here. Leave that for your cost accountant underlings, or henchmen if you're playing Dungeons and Dragons. Okay, one more set of costs here in Chapter 10 before we move on. And they're stuck at the end because they're more related to performance evaluation than production cost tracking. Controllable versus uncontrollable costs. Costs that a manager has the ability to influence versus costs that are imposed on the manager from outside. If we want to be able to make good judgments about performance measurement, and we want our employees to feel all warm and fuzzy about the performance measurement process, we have to make sure that we are only judging them based on items they can specifically control. For instance, let's say we've got a division within our firm that is required to purchase all of its raw materials from another division within the firm. Perhaps a paper division, buying from the timbering division, 
and the transfer price is decreed from above by an executive VP or someone like that. It's possible that the paper division could purchase timber from an outside source for less than the transfer price. If this is the case, the paper division manager's performance evaluation should recognize that their profitability is not as high as it could be, not because the manager isn't doing a good job, but because they are forced to purchase at an above market price. So there's the whirlwind quick tour of the costing process and how we get the costs we incur into our inventory when we're not just a retailer buying finished goods to put out on the shelves. Now it's time to turn to a neat tool we can use with our costing information beyond simply coming up with cost of goods sold for our income statement. And that tool is cost volume profit analysis. This is a very powerful tool from a planning perspective because it allows us to answer a couple of very important questions. First of all, it helps us determine how much of a product or mix of products we need to sell in order to break even or achieve a desired level of profitability. Second, it lets us see how changes in the marketplace, changes in our cost structure, or changes in our pricing will affect our bottom line. So we start with the concept of the break-even point, which, as you would expect, is the level of sales at which total revenues equals total costs. Obviously, if we sell more than that, we would get a profit, and if we sell less, we end up with a loss. And this may seem like something of a no-brainer, but this most basic bit of analysis is one of the most important things we should do before getting into a new line of business. I remember one of my old college professors who told us a story in class one day. A tax client of his had always had a dream to open a fish market. Bloop, 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 bloop. And so one day he quit his job and poured his life savings into this fish market. And it wasn't just any fish market. It was like robo fish market with top of the line refrigeration units and custom construction and everything someone who had always dreamed of owning a fish market would want in their fish market. And he had this wonderful grand opening and then a month later he shut down. Because it wasn't until after he'd opened the business that he'd done the math and discovered that given his cost structure, every man, woman, and child in the town of Woonsocket, Rhode Island, would have had to eat fish three meals a day, every day, for the rest of their lives for him to just even break even. Oops. Now, what can we learn from this? Well, this was during business law class and was meant to illustrate the point that most businesses fail not because they are bad ideas, but because people are idiots. But in the context of this class, we can see that if he had just done some simple analysis beforehand, based on what it cost him to buy his fish, and what he could sell it for, and what it cost him to run his business with utilities and licenses and such, he could have saved himself quite a bit of heartache. It could maybe have even salvaged his dreams by being more modest in the design and running of his business. So for us to make this break-even point analysis work, we have to make a number of assumptions, just like we did way back when, when we were setting up our accounting system. There are five assumptions, but really two say virtually the same thing, so I call them four and a half. The first is that the analysis must be done within a relevant range. Remember relevant range? There's a difference between going from 10,000 to 11,000 units and going from 10,000 to a million units. So if we say that a cost is fixed, we really mean it. Break-even and cost-volume profit analysis is a purely linear relationship, and our fixed costs are essentially our intercept. That number needs to be static for this stuff to work, and it won't be if we need to buy a new factory to meet our production level. If we go outside that relevant range, we're going to need a new equation. Our second assumption is that all costs are either variable or fixed, which on the face sounds like a stupid claim, but there's such thing as a mixed cost, one that has both a fixed and a variable component to it. If we have something like that, we'll treat it the way we did with our overhead calculation earlier in the class. We split out the fixed and variable components of electricity and treated them as separate items. We'll do the same with all of our costs. Everything needs to fall into either the fixed or variable cost bucket. All revenues and costs are fixed on a per unit basis. This means there are no economies of scale and no bulk discounts. This may not be terribly realistic, but for basic analysis, we need to have this in here. We'll be able to relax this assumption later, but for now we'll go ahead and use it. The half assumption flows directly from this one. The contribution margin is constant. That is, if the variable cost of our product is $2 and we get $3 to sell one unit, that $1 difference will be the same for the first, the hundredth, and the thousandth unit to be sold. Lastly, total fixed costs are fixed. If our goal is to break even, that means that we need to sell enough product to cover those fixed costs we incur to keep our business running, like rent and such. 
We can't have our target moving on us. If we say that our target is x, it needs to stay at x for the purpose of our calculations. So with those four and a half assumptions in place, we can now start to do some math. The assumptions are certainly constraining, but this can be still very helpful to us. So this is what we'll use. Now essentially, what we're going to be doing is some basic algebra, using our costs and revenues as inputs into a linear equation. We'll call our revenue per unit R, we'll call our variable cost per unit VC, and our fixed costs as FC. Our desired profit level will be P. With X being our unit sales level, we can see that our profit is equal to the contribution margin we make on all our products here, minus the fixed costs that we pay regardless of our level of sales. So where is break even? Well, that's when P is equal to zero. If we set P is equal to zero and do a little rearranging, we see that our level of sales we need to achieve in order to break even is our fixed costs divided by our per unit contribution margin. In the context of our fish market, we would divide the cost of keeping the store up and running by the gross profit per pound of fish, and x would be equal to a whole lot. Bloop, 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 bloop. Let's say that Dave Corp has the following costs associated with its donut hole operations. We can sell each one for 50 cents. So this is some gourmet donut hole action we're talking about here. And we've got our fixed costs and our variable costs. So what is the profit for any particular level of sales? Well, my selling price of 50 cents times x minus our variable cost of 0 0.06 times x minus our fixed costs of 35,000. And that will give us our profit for any level of sales. If we sell one donut hole, things aren't so good. If we sell a million donut holes, things are substantially better. So how much do we need to sell to break even? Set P is equal to zero. And if we do that, we find our contribution margin condenses down to 44 cents. And if we divide both sides by 0.44, we find that to break even, we'll need to sell 79,546 donut holes. Wow, that's a boatload of donut holes. We can, of course, adapt this to achieve any given level of profitability. Because if I want to quit my job to sell donut holes, I need to do better than just break even. We can do a little rearranging to incorporate P, and then we plug in our desired profit level to get a new X. If we decide that we want to earn $10,000, then we'll have 0.5 times X minus 0.6 times X minus 35,000 equals $10,000, and that will yield an X of 102,273 donut holes. And we can, of course, go even further and say we want to hit that $10,000 profit after taxes. Well, if we're being hit with a 40% tax rate, then that 10,000 after tax profits means we need to earn $16,667 in pre-tax profits. So we'll copy all of this stuff right down here, changing this to be 16,667, and this will give us a new unit target, 117,424 units. Now let's take a look at one more thing. We aren't locked into setting P as our unknown. Again, this is just algebra, so what else can we do? Well, let's say that we still want that after-tax profit of $10,000, but we don't realistically believe that we can sell more than 115,000 units, and 50 cents is not a number that we can play around with. Given our current cost structure, we need 117,000 and change, so we're going to have to cut corners somewhere. Let's rewrite the equation, and now we have VC and FC as our unknowns. How are we going to get to our target profit? Well, first, let's hold our fixed cost constant. If we're locked into that $35,000 number, then we're going to plug to variable cost in the equation, and solving for VC yields 5.1 cents per donut hole. Is that feasible for us to do? Can we optimize production to reduce labor costs, or find a cheaper supplier, or skimp a bit on the materials, or a combination of the three? Alternatively, we could set our variable cost as given. Perhaps if we try to skimp on the materials, the smaller size and lower quality will cause us to lose market share to our competitors. So plug everything in again, leaving only our fixed costs as unknown. 
Solving the equation, if we can get our fixed costs down to $33,933, we'll be able to hit that $10,000 after-tax profit. Perhaps this means finding a cheaper storefront, or being more targeted with our advertising budget, or perhaps getting wage concessions from the union for our salaried employees. And of course, we could hit that target by a combination of the two. But we've now got our endpoints beyond which we won't have to cut costs either on the fixed or variable side. So now, back when we set up our assumptions, we assumed a bunch of static items. Costs were fixed. Revenues per unit were fixed. But the world doesn't work like that. So what do we do when conditions change? This is again a planning tool, so we can be prepared to adjust our business if something significant happens. So let's go back to that break-even equation, expressing units in the context of fixed costs and contribution margin. Looking at this, how do we need to adapt if any of these items change? Let's say that fixed costs increase. If that's the case, the only way to maintain our equation is to increase our units or increase our contribution margin. Say our selling price decreases, so R goes down. R going down will decrease our denominator. So again, we'll either have to increase our volume or we'll need to trim either our fixed or our variable costs. Lastly, assume that our variable cost increases. Same thing, our denominator has gone down, which means increase prices or volume or decrease our fixed costs. This is all common sense, but inputting numbers and rerunning the equations will help us prepare for the unexpected. Of course, these changes don't have to be things imposed on us from the outside. The proactive actions we take within the marketplace can affect one or more of these items, and the relationships between those variables are often predictable. So let's make some decisions about our business, now that we are already established within the market. Let's say that we could open another retail outlet, which will increase fixed costs by $5,000, but will sell another 10,000 donut holes. Is this a good idea or a bad idea? Well, we see two things at work here. We're increasing our fixed costs, but we're increasing our volume as well. So let's take them individually and see what their net impact is. First, we've got the volume increase. We're going to sell another 10,000 units. We know that our contribution margin per unit is 44 cents, so this is going to yield us $4,400 of additional contribution margin. But our fixed costs are going to go up. By how much? By $5,000. And so we look at these two pieces of information and we say, hmm, shall I open this new location? And the answer will be no, because we're paying $5,000 in order to gain $4,400 of increased contribution margin. That seems like a bad idea. Let's say we decide to decrease our prices in order to be more competitive. We plan on decreasing our price from 50 cents to 40 cents, and we expect this will net us another 35,000 units. Is this a good idea or a bad idea? Well, again, let's look at what this is going to do. Our contribution margin on the 100,000 units we already sell is going to decline by $10,000. 100,000 units at a dime each is 10 grand. There's the downside. But what do we get for that decreased price? An extra 35,000 units, which will yield us a contribution margin of 34 cents each, which will yield us an increase in contribution margin of $11,900. So is this a good idea or a bad idea? Well, we're giving up $10,000 in return for $11,900. That seems like a very good idea. Last one. This is America, the home of the outrageous portion size. So let's say we think we can increase our sales by 10,000 units if we increase the size of our product. This will, of course, cost us extra in variable costs. Our contribution margin will be decreased by 2 cents, and the 100,000 units we sell that cost us an extra 2 pennies will yield us $2,000 less in contribution margin. Of course, we'll end up selling those extra 10,000 units, and we'll realize a contribution margin of 42 cents each, meaning we'll be in the black by 4,200. So again, we look at those two numbers, and we decide that this is indeed a good idea. Now, so far, we've been restricting ourselves to a single product, and that's not exactly reflective of reality in most cases. So what happens when we sell several different products and we want to determine our break-even point in sales? Well, the solution is to combine our products into a basket with an expected product mix. Doing so collapses those multiple products into a single X, 
and we can then calculate our break-even point. So let's say we're entering that lucrative fritter market, and we have the following cost and revenue amounts. If we assume a ratio of 10 donut holes to one fritter, we now have a baked goods basket, much like Little Red Riding Hood, but without the wolf. So let's look at the table that I have for you in your notes and fill in some numbers. We've got within our basket 10 donut holes, which sell for 50 cents each and which cost 6 cents of variable cost to produce. This contributes $5 of R and 60 cents of variable cost to our contribution margin. Our one fritter has a $2 revenue and a variable cost of 17 cents and when we add the two together our baked goods basket will yield us seven dollars of revenue and have variable costs of 77 cents for a contribution margin of six dollars and 23 cents and then we go back to our prior analysis and carry on our merry way of course this is all contingent on the product mix ratio being correct if it turns out that people aren't buying fritters in the quantity we expected that's going to wreak havoc on our financial results now while all of this discussion has been in the context of a manufacturer of donut holes or a retailer of fish, any firm can use this same framework to make the same decisions. More and more students taking this class are coming from the not-for-profit or service industries, and I want to make sure that you understand that this is just as applicable to you. So long as we can break down our costs into fixed and variable, we can do break-even analysis and cost-volume profit analysis. Let's take a look at a healthcare business to see how we can get it to work. Huss and Peds, a completely fictional pediatric practice in Bangor, Maine, leases office space for $30,000 a year. Non-physician costs are $500,000 and applied overhead is another seventy. dollars Patients are billed $135 per RVU and the physicians are compensated on a salary plus basis, which in practice yields a payment of about $50 per RVU. First of all, let's do our break-even calculation. We've got $135 times x minus 50 times x, which gives us our contribution margin. Our fixed costs total $600,000, and we set our profits equal to zero since we're trying to calculate break-even RVU. We see that given this particular cost structure, we're looking at needing an x equaling 7,059 RVUs to break even. Don't! Oh! If we were to substitute our actual 7,000 into the equation, we find ourselves taking a $40,000 loss. So let's look at some CVP. Let's say that Medicaid has reduced reimbursements, again. So we're going to lose, on average, $5 per RVU. What does this mean for the practice? Well, the short answer is, they're screwed. The longer answer is, contribution margin has gone down, which means they need to adapt. Adapt how? Well, let's throw that new average R into our equation with minus 40 being our P. And we'll discover that we now need to generate 8,000 RVUs instead of the 7,000 and change we were generating before. We can do this for accounting or legal firms, which bill out professionals at some rate and then pay those employees a wage. We could do this for not-for-profits who provide services to clients and who receive reimbursements and donations from third parties. Speaking of those not-for-profits, how do we keep track of all that stuff when we get a grant from some foundation or another? Well, it depends on the type of grant we received. If it's a case where the donor is matching funds contributed by the client, then that becomes an adjustment to our R value. It doesn't really matter who paid us for this analysis to work, so long as the payment is happening. If the grant is a lump sum, not tied specifically to individual clients and the services we perform for them, then we treat it as a reduction in fixed costs. That is, we pretend that this grant is paying some or all of our rent, or our bookkeeping costs, or something like that. Here's our new equation. One last thing to look at. Degree of operating leverage. This looks at the relationship between fixed and variable costs within our cost structure. Where did we hear that term leverage before? Back in the debt chapters, right? And the idea was that we leveraged other people's money, that's the debt, to earn greater profits for the shareholders. Well, operating leverage is a similar concept. We're going to be looking at how we have structured our costs to give us relatively more or less contribution margin per dollar of sales. And how do we achieve that? By becoming more mechanized and less labor-reliant, perhaps. Let's look at three companies with different cost structures.
Firm A, which is very heavily reliant on variable costs, might be a produce company, which requires tons of labor to bring the product to market. And the labor doesn't require much in the way of equipment. On the other end, we've got a company with lots of fixed costs and not a lot of variable costs, which is going to be a highly automated manufacturer who throws the raw material in on one side and out the back end comes the product. Operating leverage is calculated as contribution margin divided by net income. First, looking at contribution margin per firm, we've got 300 minus 200 is equal to $100 of contribution margin for firm 1, $160 for firm 2, and $240 for firm 3. And when we divide those numbers by net income, we get this lovely little table in your notes. The firm with relatively more fixed costs has a higher degree of operating leverage than the firm with relatively less fixed costs. And what does this translate into? Different profits associated with changes in volume. Let's say that sales increase by 10%. For company 1, that means revenue goes up by 30, variable cost goes up by 20, yielding $10,000 of total incremental revenue. For firm 2, we're looking at 30 minus 14, or 16, and company 3 is 30 minus 6, or 24. So company 3 makes significantly more profit from the sale of those future products, even though they all increased their raw sales by the same amount. Now this is all well and good, but there's a downside to this as well. Because all those fixed costs mean that we have to sell quite a bit more in order to hit our break-even point. And this means that if there's a decrease in sales as opposed to an increase, we're going to be in some serious trouble. And that brings us to the concept of safety margin, or how much can sales decrease and still be able to cover our fixed costs. Let's take a look at Firm 1. They had revenues of 300000 and variable costs of 200, which means their contribution margin is one-third of sales. So, they need to sell $180,000 of stuff to generate sufficient contribution margin to cover their fixed costs of $60,000. They are currently selling three hundred, dollars so they could lose $120,000 of sales, or 40%, and still be able to cover their fixed costs. Firm 3, on the other hand, makes a contribution margin of 80 cents on the dollar, but have a lot more fixed costs to cover. They need to sell $250,000 of product in order to cover the $200,000 of fixed costs they face. So their margin of safety is quite a bit lower. They can only afford to lose about 17% of sales before they can't pay their proverbial rent. They don't have the flexibility to simply reduce workforce in case there's a drop off in demand. So the moral of the story is that we shouldn't look at that operating leverage math and decide that we should load up on fixed costs out the wazoo in order to maximize profits for the owners. When determining how we're going to produce our product or service, we have to look at the risk we take by doing so and find a number that we are comfortable with. So there's our crash course in costing and a couple of the decision tools we can use to analyze and plan our operations. Next chapter, we'll take a quick detour and look at the budgeting process, and then we'll come back to do a bit more advanced costing stuff 